Um, and thanks to all of you for being here, for braving the, the storms and the winds out there to be here to, uh, to listen to dance. Not something you probably imagined you would be doing 10 years ago. And yet, um, I have a lot of uh, interesting, I hope interesting and wonderful things to share with you. I really have three objectives for today. The first is, if you're already participating in a dance program, I hope to give you a little... Uh, understanding, more understanding of why that class can be so beneficial to managing uh, life well with Parkinson's. Number two, if you're not already uh, participating in one of the wonderful dance classes here in Dallas or wherever you live, um, I hope that this presentation gives you a little elbow into uh, trying it out, just checking it out for yourself. And three, if you're one of those people who say, you know, you'll never find me in a dance class, I hope at least to give you some strategies that you can try in your daily life that will enable you to think like a dancer and therefore to move with fluidity and grace through your daily lives. So uh, those are my, my objectives for today. Um, I'm going to be talking for a bit, but mixed within that will be some interactive and participatory experiences. So I encourage you, wherever you are, whether you're at home or whether you're here with us today, to, uh, to move with me. As m I know we don't have a huge amount of space, but to move within the uh, kinesphere that you have and to try out some of the activities, because they will underscore what I'm, uh, what I'm saying in the, in the lecture. Um, I also am going to show a few different film clips because I think it's really important that the benefits of the program are expressed not just from, from my perspective, but from the participants' perspective. So you get to hear from them what it is that makes this class uh, worthwhile and beneficial for them. So I'm actually going to start with a brief film uh, that's based on our experience in Brooklyn, we offer a weekly class uh, in our uh, dance center in Brooklyn. We also offer classes in 10 locations around New York. So to kind of get you into this area of, of thinking, um, I'm going to introduce you to some of our members The motivation for starting a dance class for people with Parkinson's came from the desire to help people remember who they are is still the most important component of their existence, not Parkinson's. At first didn't want to do it because I thought I'd be associating with a lot of people on the stage of Parkinson's that I didn't want to be at and that would be discouraging to me. But I finally wept and I've never regretted the decision that I made. Medicines can't always do as much as we want, so I've been recommending people for years and years to take dance for PD. I see transformation happen in front of my eyes. So people often come into the class with a lot of rigidity, and suddenly in that space, they come alive. My hands are so stiff I can't straighten my hand out. You know, just start moving gently and all of that stiffness goes away. There is something magical that takes place in there. I'm not sitting there thinking about my body. I'm just trying to move. I hear from my patients when they come back how much it seems to support and sustain them emotionally. I look to the rest of the group for inspiration. We are there for moral, spiritual, emotional support. When I came in, I really didn't even have a chance to be skeptical because the group immediately embraces you. It's a time when you connect and you don't have to be embarrassed because everybody else has a problem too. <laughs> it gives people the courage to leave their apartments and go somewhere else and have a different kind of experience than they do when they're alone, which ends up being a lot of the time. When someone shakes hands with someone who can hardly hold their hand up, they're honoring the humanness of the individual. The feeling I get from being in this group is a feeling that it's going to be hard to replace with any other activity. So I hope uh, it lasts as long as I do. No matter what stage you are or what your previous experience has been with exercise or movement, you belong here. Come try it once. Do a few moves. Enjoy the music, enjoy the sense of community, you're gonna to wanna to come back.
A lot of people ask me, how did you get involved with this? I was a professional dancer for about 20 years, 15 of those spent with the Mark Morris Dance Group. And they say, well, do you have someone in your family with Parkinson's? Do you, how, did, how did you start teaching this? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a background uh, so that you can understand how this program evolved. And then we're going to go under the hood and really try to understand what it is that dancers do in their training and how that thinking can be valuable for people with Parkinson's. So uh, you heard from Oli in the film very briefly, Oli Westheim. Uh, is the founder and uh, former director of the Brooklyn Parkinson Group, which was a support group that was affiliated with uh, King's uh, Hospital, Downstate Medical College in Brooklyn. And she was really charged with creating a support group uh, in Brooklyn that was an outshoot of that hospital, offshoot of that hospital. Uh, but when Oli started these meetings, she realized that people in the groups were spending a lot of time thinking about and talking about and worrying about and sharing anxieties about Parkinson's. And she realized, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a state of em embodied medicalization that's going on. That people feel that they are permanent patients. They are surrounded by symptoms. They're thinking about these symptoms. They're thinking about their pill schedules. How can we escape this? How can we give people in these groups a chance to think about themselves differently, a chance to connect through a different medium? And only had a dance background, so she was thinking about dance as a possible activity. She was also thinking about walks in the park. We could have been called Walk for PD. She thought about going to museums together. We could have been called Art for PD. But she kept coming back to what dancers do and the spirit of fun and social connection that, happen in, that happens in a dance class. So she uh, really started the, this idea of creating a social space for people to connect through dance. And what, what she also was thinking about was, and we'll talk a lot about this to, this morning, is this idea that dancers use strategies of intent, which I love, I love that word, right, intent. So the intention behind the movement is a critical part of dance training. And she felt like that strategy of intent and many other strategies that dancers use would be helpful for people with Parkinson's in managing some of the motor challenges that come up. So it was kind of a double-edged sword. Well, really two double-edged swords. On the one hand, the class that she envisioned was a way to escape from Parkinson's. It was a way to say no to Parkinson's for an hour a week and not to have anything to do with it. Uh, on the other hand, she realized that the class would have a lot of really beneficial strategies for people with Parkinson's and might even address some of those strategies head on. So uh, the, the, uh, the other part was that the, dan the, the dance class is really meant to be a social environment, right? A chance for people just to connect in a different setting, but she also wanted it to be a workshop and a lab for people to start to explore movement and to own their movements in a different way. So in 2001, she approached us at the Mark Morris Dance Group. We had just built this new building. Uh, which doesn't look so new in this photo because you see some of the, the, the dirt of New York on the sides there. But it was brand spanking new in 2001, and we had a very strong message. The message was that this center is open to the entire community. Yes, this is the rehearsal home of the Mark Morris Dance Group, which is a professional, internationally known company, but it is also a place for the community to come and dance and take classes and... Uh, attend performances and rehearse and all of that. So we didn't know exactly who was in the community. We hadn't done focus groups and, and marketing studies, but we did send out the message that we really wanted to be available to ev everybody. And what uh, was really supporting this philosophy was the, the, the guy at the top, Mark Morris. Now, Mark grew up in Seattle and... Um, had a very uh, diverse range of dance backgrounds, but he attended a community dance school. It was not a conservatory, it was not a recital school, it was just a place for everybody to come and dance and participate at whatever level they wanted to, to be at. And so when Mark built his own building, he used that school in Seattle as a model. And Mark very firmly believes that dance may not be for everybody, it's not everybody's cup of tea, Nobody should be forced to dance. However, 
it should be made available to anybody. And anybody who steps into the doors of the Mark Morris Dance Center is invited to participate in classes, just as everybody who steps into Misty Owen's wonderful classes here in Dallas is invited to join in the dance. So, along with that, uh, when Oli came into our building and said, I want to do this, we said, yes, and we would love to be able to provide teaching artists and musicians and space. And at the time, this is me in some, uh, some of my roles as a performer, um, I didn't have any knowledge of Parkinson's. I did not have a family member with Parkinson's, and I didn't really have a working knowledge of the challenges. What I did have was a passion for teaching and experience teaching different kinds of people, different populations from three years old all the way up to 90. And I did a lot of that teaching as part of my work with the company. So it made sense when uh, our executive director asked me to participate that I would say yes, because I love to teach and I was very intrigued with the idea of teaching people for whom movement might not be as comfortable as it, as it was for the professional dancers I often trained. So Dance for P P PD really came about as a marriage between the Brooklyn Parkinson Group and the Mark Morris Dance Group, a collaboration, right? Brooklyn Parkinson Group was able to offer um, expertise as it related to the Parkinson community, and we were able to offer expertise as it pertained to dance instruction, um, music, live music, and uh, a world of the arts which is really what Oli wanted. She wanted people to be able to come in and feel that they were connected to this, this world of artists. The other thing that ha happened, we started classes in 2001. So we started very small, once a month for six people. And those six brave people came every month. And after the first year, we had a major increase. We went up to eight people. <laughs> And then we started classes once a, uh, twice a month, and then Misty started working with us, and we went to once a week, and then the class grew another exponential amount to about 15. And then after that, it started to build, and it really built in the beginning through word of mouth. It might be hard to imagine, but if we think back 20 years, and this program is, is almost 18 years old, physical activity was, was counter-indicated for Parkinson's, right? When you went and got a diagnosis from a neurologist, they wouldn't say, as they do now, you should be exercising, you should be physically active. They would actually perhaps even discourage you from doing that because they were concerned about fall risk. And there wasn't a lot of research on the benefits of exercise. So this whole idea of being physically active as a way to manage your Parkinson's is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, so when we started, we did not get very much support from the medical community. We didn't get a lot of support from the physical therapy community. We really felt like we were on our own in this venture. Uh, what we did have was a distribution model. So in addition to offering classes in Brooklyn and getting the word out through uh, the Brooklyn Parkinson Group and through other contacts, we, uh, the Mark Morris Dance Group is a touring company. So when we started uh, taking Dance for PD on the road wherever we toured, we started realizing there was a great need and interest in this kind of program, right? So whether we were in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, or San Francisco, California, or London, England, or Tel Aviv, Israel, wherever we were, we would always try to work with the Parkinson's community there to offer a demonstration class. Well, that might work very well from our perspective, but what about the people taking the classes? Well, what happened was they would say, that was great, when's the next class? And we'd say, well, we're leaving town tomorrow. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a, of a flash in the pan technique, which in the long run really didn't serve the community. And so out of that, we started to develop a training program. So we would, uh, Wherever we went, we would collect the names of teachers who might be interested in this kind of program. Uh, we would then write to them and say, hey, we're offering a training in New York, can you come? We would started offering the training for free. We currently don't offer it for free, uh, but we started with a, with a free model, and we started to develop a pool of teachers around the world. Um, and what has happened over the last 11, 12 years of that kind of expansion is this. So we see classes all over the world. One of the really cool things for me 
uh, coming from our little circle in New York where we're focused on specific techniques like ballet and modern and tap and jazz and musical theater and improvisation, is to see that the approach that we use, the model that we use, is applicable in, in every culture around the world, even if the content needs to change. So what does that mean? Well, it means in Pune, India, where there's a very robust program that's offered three times a week, it puts us in New York and Dallas to shame, really. Um, they have taken the model of what we do, but they've infused it with their own dance forms. So they're using Katak dance, which is a traditional classical Indian form, and, uh, and Bollywood dancing at the end of class when we might do something like West Side Story or uh, musical theater. So they've t basically taken exactly this template, but they've made it culturally specific to uh, people in Pune. And the same thing is happening in Seoul, Korea, in, um, in Beijing, China. Wherever this class takes roots, the fundamental pillars of what we do in those classes is the same, but the dance content itself is very flexible. And that has enabled the program to grow. The other thing that's helped is media. About 2011, 12, we created a series of DVDs um, that are really meant to be used at home. And there were really two purposes, three purposes. One was for those people who are already taking classes but only get one class a week, how can we help them dance on the off days, right? In those days when they're waiting for the next class. Well, they can pop in their at-home DVD and practice exercises with me or with Misty or with John, who are the three founding teachers. Uh, the DVD also serves as a a way to introduce people to the program who may not yet have a class to go to and has helped people uh, develop a desire for dance that has turned into a demand to have a live class. So often the DVD is the first step. People will say, oh, I really like this. It's not as scary as I thought it would be. And they'll connect with the Parkinson's group in their community and together they might approach a local dance studio to start a class. So media has played a role in distributing this, uh, this idea, Oli's idea, around the world. Uh, and in the early days, because we didn't get a lot of support from the medical community, we also relied on, on press. And we've gotten uh, a lot of notice in, in local, national, international press, really highlighting uh, observational benefits, right? What started to happen around 2008-9 was a research literature. And this was very important for us, uh, not because we are a science-based uh, program, we are an arts program. However, we realized that because we're intersecting with healthcare and with neurology and with physical therapists, we really need to have a research literature that supports the benefits of what we saw and, and heard anecdotally, right? Because we would hear stories, but we weren't really sure what was happening in the data. Uh, there are now more than 38 studies on the impact of dance on people with Parkinson's, um, with notable improvements in areas like gait, tremor, rigidity, uh, short-term mobility, balance, cognitive function, quality of life, social inclusion, self-esteem, and mood. And uh, as an artist, I put these equally. I don't see the motor symptoms being more important than the quality of life challenges. I see them all equal. Everybody has a different, uh, a, a different cornucopia of challenges. And um, for us to say, well, this program helps walking, therefore it's a good program, doesn't make sense. So we really want to see robust research, but we want to see research in a variety of areas that really get at quality of life. Um, particularly as an arts intervention, the areas of confidence and self-esteem and mood are particularly important for us because we're an express, it's, this is an expressive art form. So because for us, for, from my perspective, Parkinson's is a, an anti-theatrical condition. It takes away a lot of the vehicles that you have for expressing yourself, whether through your voice right, through your body, through your face. So uh, those elements, which are not often studied in the literature, are very important to us. So we want to make sure that the literature continues to reflect the broad spectrum of what we think dance has to offer. But really, the most important research for us was listening. Listening to our participants. Listening, listening to people like Carol Niesman, who is a, an ex-Marine, unfortunately no longer with us, ex-Marine, and very high-powered New York litigator for many years. Uh, you would not want to meet Carol in the courtroom. 
<laughs> but I was very glad to meet him in the dance studio because he came in uh, with the full intent of becoming a dancer and in the first year became so enamored of tap dancing that he started to ask Misty to give him private lessons. Some of you know Misty. Um, and so this is a man who really ne never danced in his life, suddenly on fire about the idea of being able to express himself through his body and through his feet. Um, the other really interesting thing about Carol is that he started to use some of those techniques as very practical skills to help him get out of bed. So instead of just trying to step forward out of bed, he would use some of the tap vocabulary that Misty taught him to launch himself out of bed, particularly in the wee small hours when he uh, had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and couldn't see well and, and didn't have his bearings. He used that as a way of grounding himself. So the, the creative and practical sides of dance. Somebody like Reggie Butts, who in the last five years of um, his time in our program encountered a lot of other medical challenges, aside from Parkinson's. But regardless of what challenges came up, he always attended class. Uh, so much so that he would, he would actually come from the hospital to come into class in the afternoon, right? And that's a story of commitment, dedication, focus, and confidence. Someone like Sharon Reason, who told me uh, about a year ago, she said, you know, I never used to want to dance at family events, but because of what we do in class and because of the confidence it's given me, I went to a wedding last week and I was able to dance for three hours. It's not just the stamina that you've given me, but it's the confidence of dancing in public. So it's, again, it's not always about how much, uh, how much stride length increases in a study. It's about these personal stories, right? People making changes in their lives, people being able to do activities of daily living with more ease because of their experience in the class. And finally, Herb Heinz, who's based in the West Coast, is a musician and composer. And Herb, really about six months into taking the class, uh, started using the strategies to help him get out of a freeze. So he used to experience some freezing of gait uh, out in public, and this happened to him at a grocery store. And he said to himself, instead of panicking, I'm gonna think of myself as a choreographer, and I'm gonna choreograph my way to the checkout counter instead of, instead of trying to walk. And by thinking about that task as a dancer, as a choreographer, he was actually able to get going again. We also hear stories and see examples now in the medical community. This is Dr. Helen Bronte Stewart, uh, one of my inspirations and a mentor of sorts. Uh, Helen was a dancer for many years. She grew up in Scotland and danced uh, there in the UK for, for a long time before going to medical school and training to be a neurologist. She's now one of the most eminent neurologists in the country, does a lot of work also with DBS. She's based at Stanford University, where she runs the Movement Disorder Clinic. When Stanford decided to build a new neuroscience building, Helen said, well, how can you build a building without a dance studio in it? And so she advocated to have a dance studio, which she's standing in right here, uh, as part of the front lobby, the, the entrance lobby of the new Neuroscience Institute at Stanford. So we're now seeing medical professionals really embracing the idea of dance and intentional movement and bringing that into the clinic. So I talked a little earlier about wherever this class appears, there are, there are recognizable elements of DNA, and I wanna go over those, those pillars. So the first is that we use a mix of styles grounded in ballet, modern, tap, improvisation, repertory, and I'm gonna fill in as well sort of other classical forms and other world dance. So those are, that's what we use in Brooklyn, but again, uh, that model can be, can be changed. And what's really important about that is that we're drawing on sort of a best of list. So you might have heard of programs like Tango for Parkinson's or Salsa for Parkinson's, like very specific forms, and those are great programs, uh, particularly if you like those forms. What Misty and I and other teachers try to do in our program is really to bring in a variety of styles because we realize everybody has different preferences, everybody likes different kinds of music. Let's see if we can find something that everybody's gonna be able to hold on to. We also feel that there are beneficial activities from different techniques, and we really try to bring those, those in and create the best possible experience for you as the participants. The second is that we develop a progressive warm-up from the beginning of class to the end. So 
everything is scaffolded, everything has preparation. You never just jump into something. And this is very important in any kind of athletic training, of course, but in dance, it's something that is extremely important because it relates to how we learn things, right? In, in motor learning, it's very difficult to jump into complex action right away. You have to work with building blocks. So we start by building up little pieces, we start putting those together into longer phrases and, and uh, create longer activities from that. Uh, so the progressive warm-up is a big part of our model and it's a very important part of our training. Teaching techniques that we use are always based on the idea that dance is an art form. So we're using things like imagery, music, aesthetic awareness, what does something look like and what does it feel like? Not how high does your arm go or how many of this thing can you do, right? So we're focused a little less away from the quantitative mechanics of moving and more in the qualitative. How do we move? How can we think about moving? What are the qualities that we're using to move? And I put co-creation in there. This is a very important element as well. How can you, as a participant, have a voice in the creative process? So it's not just me as the teacher guiding you and you imitating me, but actually you improvising and you making up dances and you coming in with creative material. That's really important to me. And finally, this idea that everybody is included, and the way we do that is by showing ways that movement can be adapted for all levels of ability and mobility. And that's really important because it means that the dance activity is something that you can do throughout your entire progression of Parkinson's. Um, with some other programs, there's, a, there's kind of a, a wall where it's at some point you say, you know what, I think this is too difficult for me. In the dance class, we have people at all stages of Parkinson's coming in. Some people remain seated for the whole class. Some people are standing the whole class. Some people do the whole class in a wheelchair. Some people use walkers. Whatever you're coming in with, we are trained to work with you and to make that experience as positive for you as possible. So that's really important. The other thing is that we include partners, spouses, grandkids, anyone who wants to come to the class with you is invited and welcome to come. Um, and in that way, the class is very much a family experience, which I think makes it that much richer. So we think about movement and dance. I think it uh, begs the question, what is the difference between dance and other forms of exercise? And so I'm gonna go through a little bit of what I call under the hood to help us under, understand what is in the engine that drives the benefits of dance. And I'm going to ask us to do a little bit of uh, movement together. So you've, you've been sitting now for a little while. I'm just gonna invite you to stretch your, your hands out and you can just uh, kind of flex your wrists a little bit. I think we all do a lot of driving or, and or typing. So it's all good or texting, right? Good to kind of get those hands moving a little bit, right? And you can just open your Palms a little bit, rotating, right? This is something you might do with a, with a physical therapist or with your neurologist as well, right? Over and under, right? Just ro gentle rotations. And then we're gonna stretch up. Good, just opening your fingers a little bit. You're gonna stretch out straight ahead of you. You're gonna stretch down. You're gonna stretch down and then one more big yawn. Oof, and then without hitting anybody, a little bit of a circle to come together. Yeah, good. All right, so I describe that activity very much in uh, mechanical terms. I talked about stretching. I talked about the benefits of it, right? You're going to stretch your wrists. I talked about um, stretching out, sort of just a very basic um, physical language. What hap That's where dance starts. It sta starts with sort of just some basic moves, but what we do as dancers is we think about layers that we apply on top of that movement. So now I'm gonna think a little bit about some imagery. And I want us to think, instead of just stretching our hands forward, I want us to imagine that we're dipping our hands into a beautiful pool of water, right? So how does that change the approach that I'm using to move, right? So there's a beautiful softness and maybe a nice warm, watery feeling at the end, yeah. And maybe a little bit of resistance, so I'm not just plunking my hands out, but there's a sensitivity, yeah. And then instead of just turning my hands over, I'm gonna think about receiving a gift. I'm gonna bring that gift back to me, right? So, oh, thank you, yeah. And if you're a gift giver, you can think about presenting a gift. The movement is the same, right? Depends on your personality, okay? Yeah. Um, and then instead of just thinking about stretching, I want you to imagine that you're on stage at the, the Winspear Opera House here. I managed to get a, 
a photo of it last night. I snuck in and stood on the middle of the stage, and then I, no. I got this from the internet. But um, the, the idea is to give you a feeling of what it is like to stand on stage. And I know that Samantha and all of the therapists here talk about projecting your voice, thinking about speaking past the two inches in front of you. Dancers do exactly the same thing with our body. We think about that top balcony. That's where all my friends sit, by the way, because they, they can afford to sit up there. Um, they're sitting right up at the back, back balcony. If, if I'm just doing that movement here, they're not going to be able to see that movement. They're not going to read my expression. So I need to think about projecting with my whole spirit up to that top balcony. So we can try that as well. So there's my reach. It's not just stretching my hands. It's actually a reach to that very upper balcony. The middle balcony, the conductor, who's not there yet, and then a little shimmy up and circle around. So now I have some images, some qualities to play with. Now, the next stage is what I would call sequencing or phrasing. This is very much like speaking as well. Dancers think about movement sentences. We call them sequences or phrases. And we can put these moves into a little bit of a sequence. And they go like, goes like this. Reach into the water, reach into the water, receive your gift, and come back. Reach into the water, reach, receive your gift, turn your gift over, and come back. So there's a little extra move there. Then I'm going to reach high to the balcony, to the mezzanine, the orchestra, down to the players, all the way up, and I come through. Yeah, good. So now I have a whole sentence. It has a logic. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has high points and quiet points, right? Now all we need is some music. So we started the beginning with some basic movement, right? We added a layer of imagery. We made it into a sentence, and now the wonderful gift that music can provide. Reaching high, high, middle, low, from the bottom, shimmy. Let's try one more time, really listening. Reach together and down, down, reach, circle back, high, middle. Beautiful. And up. Good. Yes. Good. Very nice. And the final, I hope you tried that at home, folks. Um, the final layer of this is that you just learned a little bit of Mark Marsh repertory. This is from a piece um, that Mark made in response to a commission by Yo-Yo Ma, which just showed in the previous frame as well. This was uh, a project called Inspired by Bach, which basically took each of the Bach cello suites uh, and asked a, uh, a different artist to create something based on that music. So Mark was asked to do the third cello suite, of which you just heard a section, and created a piece called Falling Down Stairs. And I always uh, mention that the name of that title at, at uh, events because it's, it's a little bit of a shocking title, particularly when we're talking about, uh, we're talking to people with Parkinson's, right? We don't want to encourage falling down stairs. This was actually based very much on the music. And if anybody knows this music, you know that the very first thing that happens in the first movement is this wonderful descending scale that goes, yum, ba da 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 And when Mark heard that, he thought, boy, that sounded kind of like someone falling down the stairs. So that's actually the beginning of the piece is all of the dancers standing on a staircase on stage, and we all run and um, very dramatically slide across the, the floor. So that's the beginning. So again, the, the title is really about music. It's about the influence of music on movement, which is such a critical part of what we do and I think what you just experienced. So this begs the, uh, the question, what is it that dancers do in their training that can be helpful for people with Parkinson's? And I, I quote here a, a wonderful dancer, former dancer, and um, now business consultant who uses choreography as a way of helping business leaders make better decisions, right, in the creative process. Talks about, we spend a lot of time in the arts talking about performance, and you probably all have gone to performances of music or dance or theater or film, but we, um, we don't talk a lot about the process behind that. And I think the process is fascinating, and particularly for, um, for the 
dancers we're working with, understanding that process is incredibly helpful and beneficial. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that process so you understand what goes on. And I'm going to start with a little bit of a cheeky um, suggestion here that, uh, again, we're not necessarily working on pirouettes in class. However, I did want to bring up the example of turning um, because it, is, it was one of the topics of conversation between Oli Westheimer, the visionary behind this program, and her husband, who is a neurologist. And they were talking about this gentleman here on the left, whose name is Ludwig von Helmholtz. Von Helmholtz was a physicist and a physician, when you could be both, right, in 19th century Germany, and uh, obviously a very smart guy, worked a lot with the idea of how the brain sees the world around it, right? Optical perception. And one of the one of the principles that he was really interested in was this idea that when we look from one point to another point, we kind of edit out everything in between. You can try that for yourself. If you pick one point in the room and then you uh, strategically target another point, everything in between is kind of a blur, right? You can try the opposite of that, where when you look at one point, you very slowly try to scan and take in everything, and I think you'll realize it's, it's overwhelming for the brain. It's like a very high-resolution scanner on your printer. It takes a long time. And yes, you do get an amazing image, but if you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, it, it's not a practical way to operate, right? You can't look from here and say, hold on, before you attack me, I just need to make sure I have an exit strategy. You need to be able to go, right? So obviously, our brain has evolved to be able to edit, to be able to, to be very strategic in how it looks. And Oli said, oh, that's really interesting, because that's exactly what dancers do when we turn. We, do a, uh, we use a technique called spotting. So because I knew I was going to be wearing equipment, I thought I'd ask our good friend Mikhail Baryshnikov <laughs> to demonstrate what spotting is. This is the wonderful scene from White Nights, where Baryshnikov shows his 11 pirouettes for the great late Gregory Hines. And Gregory Hines is like, wow, okay. Um, so I show that not to say that that's what we do in Dance for PD, but I show it to show a specific neurological principle in action, right? Bershnikov has trained for many, many years to use that specific strategy of editing out everything else but the one spot that he's looking at. And that helps him maintain his balance uh, keep a rhythm in his turns, keep momentum in the turns, and uh, in, generally look, in general look just fantastic. So um, if you ever go to a theater where there's dance happening and you turn around and look to the back, you'll probably see a little red light. That little red light is the spotting light. It enables the dancers, when they're on stage looking out to a giant black uh, space, because we can't see you, the audience is totally in, in the dark, it enables us to have a fixed point that we can use to spot. So that, strat that is neurology in action in the theater, right? We see that strategy being used um, all over the world as a, as a cue. So this got Oli thinking a lot about other strategies that dancers might use. And again, one of the things, I want to go back to this because it is so important, one of those core elements of the class is obviously the interaction, the social dynamic that happens. But the other is really this idea that dancers have a lot of knowledge about how the body works, how we can create a sense of confidence, how we prepare for dancing, how we prepare to project our actions, how we sequence our movements. And I could probably spend an hour in each one of these words, but I'm not going to. I'm just so glad that the first one is intentional because that is clearly a theme that is, that is very familiar to all of you. Um, right? Intentionality and movement is really thinking, as we just did, about the motivation behind the movement, right? Dipping your hands into water. The phrasing of how I'm doing it. How am I going to, what kind of quality do I want to bring? And how do I create a sequential logic to that? And, and three, how can I use music to support that intentionality? Are there different kinds of music that will support different kinds of movement? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, the other big thing I think that's, that's key here is sequenced, right? A lot of people say to me, you know, when I started uh, living with Parkinson's, I felt like the roadmap 
for how to do one thing or how to get from one thing to the next started to go away. The map became fuzzy and I wasn't sure. I, I had more trouble making decisions about which way to go or, or what movement which should come next. And so uh, the, the class experience, whether we're giving you movement and asking you to replicate it or whether you're generating your own movement is very much about sequencing, right? How do we think about those roadmaps? How do we give you the power to create your own roadmaps in class, but also in your lives? So these are skills that are really uh, fundamental to training, and I'm gonna go into each of them just very briefly. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is true. If you ever have watched um, ballet training, you know it is incredibly demanding. It's as physically demanding as athletic training with the additional challenge of having to make it look good, right? When you think about training for sports, you don't, you, you're training for a specific outcome, which, which has to do with winning, but it doesn't have to necessarily look good. Yes, there are players who have a lot of grace on the stage, on the, on the field or on the court, but, um, but they're not thinking first and foremost about an aesthetic. In dance, we are thinking both about the, the physical demands of that movement, but we also have to make sure it looks good or it looks expressive or it is expressing a certain idea. It may not be beautiful uh, every time, but, it, but it's trying to express something. There's some communication going on. So just to go back, these, these are really the elements of basic exercise, right? Fitness training, strength, flexibility, stamina, balance, dance has all of those. Then we start to get up into areas where I think dance is unique in what it can offer. And this is one of them, right? Learning and mastering new skills every time. So when you come to a dance class, there's always something new that you're doing. And we know from, uh, from neuroscience that, that when we learn something new, we're actually generating new brain cells. It's one of the only things that can help us create new brain cells is when we learn something we've never done before. Uh, we're also working in quite complex skills. So we, Missy and I and other teachers really are, are uh, emphasizing access and simplicity, but even simple movements in dance engage things like multitasking, dual, dual tasking, doing several things at once, coordinating your movements to music, right? Thinking about several elements and trying to combine them. So that's where the complexity often comes in. Using aesthetic goals. This is a big one, and I think you all experienced that when we talked about our water, or our gift, right? What it looks like from the stage. These aesthetic goals are, are the things that drive us into movement. So we're not talking about lifting your arm 45 degrees. We're not talking necessarily about left and right. We're really talking about images that support your movement. And we're going to do something right now to, to, uh, to show that. So this is a little... Uh, kind of warm-up activity that I often will do at the beginning of a class. It's based very loosely on a yoga sun salutation, and I invite you just to move with me. So we're going to start by reaching our arms out and bringing our hands together. And now as I go back up, I want you to think of a steeple on a church and opening as wide as you can. Good. Reaching out and up. Bring your hands in together. Or like a rocket ship going straight up and opening like a giant flower. Nice. Big circle all the way around. Allow your hand to transform into a leaf and just to allow that leaf to float wherever you want it to go. Same thing on the other side. Reaching around. Move over here so you can see me. And allowing that hand to float like a leaf all the way down. Now imagine there's light coming out of your fingers and you're like a lighthouse. You're just scanning the sea in front of you. Same thing on the other side. Reaching as wide as you can, good. Allowing your hands to rest on your heart and opening your heart out to the room. And now bringing everybody back into your heart. Good. Thinking about a sunrise from one side of your body up and over to the other side. And a sunrise goes up. Good. And now taking both hands. And in. And reaching up and just enjoying this last moment. Beautiful flower petals opening wide to the sun, which we hope comes out later today. Nice. Good. All right. So again, I mostly talk there about... That's for you. That was beautiful. 
mostly talked about imagery there, right? We had a steeple, a rocket ship, flowers opening, a lighthouse, sunrise, right? So lots of ideas to get us moving. I didn't talk so much about mechanics or, the, or repetitions or level that we're going for. And what that means as well is that everybody gets a chance to participate, right? So whatever your level of ability is, you can, you can join this activity. Your brain can participate, and that's really critical. We've talked already a bit about this, the value of music. What is great about music in the dance environment is that it's not just a background beat. It's not just giving you the pulse, right? It's also giving you uh, an emotional reaction. It's giving you a mood. It's telling you how to move. It's, talk it's helping a lot with the imagery, right? So that previous piece, uh, Green Sleeves, which we all know, right? Very soft, smooth, fluid movement. It would, it would seem weird to do something percussive or sharp to that movement, right? So it's, it's informing how we're going to move. And to give you an example of this, um, I thought we'd take a little bit of uh, a very classic dance for PD activity, which is rock, uh, paper, scissors. We're actually going to do rock, scissors, paper. And to show you just how uh, kind of infusing your movement with a very strong... Uh, guiding music can help us embody the full, uh, the full shape of this. So, following along on one side, we're going to take rock, scissors, paper, and you can just take a little slap. Other side, rock, scissors, paper, and slap. You're going to deal your cards. We're changing games now. So you're going to deal your cards out across a giant card table. Right. And now you're going to gather all of your cards or chips up. And guess what? You've won. Yes! Woohoo! Let's try that one more time. Rock. Scissors. Think about being really percussive with your hands here. So I'm throwing those movements out. Scissors. Nice. Paper. And slap. And again, same thing with the cards here. Throw them as far from your body as you can. Two, good. Throw, nice. Throw, gathering as wide as you can, bringing everything into you. Celebrate your victory, yes! All right, another game. You're gonna gather your dice. You're gonna blow on them for good luck. All right, we're gonna wind up and throw. So we're gonna wind and throw, good. And wind and throw, good. And wind and throw, nice. And wind and throw. 52 pickup. Throw those cards anywhere you want them. All around the room. PvP team will clean up after us, don't worry. Throw, throw, throw. And coming back to our beginning, we're going to use both hands now. So coordinating both sides. Rock, scissors. Rock, scissors, paper. Dealing with both. Nice. Throw. Nice. Throw. Card sharks, all of you. Gathering it in, bringing it in. And yes! And throwing in celebration. Nice. Good. So. That was excellent. We could have done all that just with a metronome, right? I could have done it just with a beat. But the music gives it so much texture and playfulness and fun and joy. Music by the wonderful Leroy Anderson, as you, as you probably know. So music is key. And all of these, you know, all of these under the hood things work together. So music works with sequencing. When we hear music, particularly music we know, we kind of understand the form of that music, and it helps us remember what moves come next. That is the big trick. People often ask me after a performance, dancing for two hours, how do you, how do you remember all those moves? I say, it's, it's the music. It's, a, it's a, my brain and muscles reacting to the music. I know the music, I know what's supposed to happen in each part, and I just have rehearsed it, and that's how I, that's how I do it. Without the music, I would be completely lost. All right? It's like the best prompter, the best cue card you could ever imagine. So now we're starting to get into the, the cognitive elements of dance, which I think are one of the most under-researched parts of what a, a dance activity can do. Um, 
Sequencing we've talked about, planning we've talked about a bit. So thinking about what you're going to do before you're doing it, whether that's through imagery or through counting or through imagining, kind of envisioning yourself doing a move. Um, mirroring is something we do a lot. So people mirror the teacher, people do mirroring with each other. Improvisation is also key cognitively because it means that now you have to solve the problems. It's not me as the teacher making up the movements, but you have to figure out how are you going to navigate around somebody else in the space? How are you going to take some of the elements that I've given you for your improvisation and weave them into a bigger dance? So you're doing a lot of the thinking, and for me, that mirrors what happens in daily life, right? Daily life isn't always choreographed. We don't always have a plan. We get out of bed and something happens, right? So we have to be able to improvise in the moment uh, physically and be comfortable with that and be confident in that. So the dance class, we hope, allows you to have an experience of that in a safe place and then take some of those skills outside. Just to give you an example of what sequencing is, I know a lot of people are more familiar or might be more familiar with social dance. Social dancing has a lot of these cognitive skills in them. This is a basic box step, right? So I have to know exactly where my feet have to fall on the floor. That's a pattern. That's a mo motor pattern that I have to learn and remember. And then I have to be able to do it in a different direction. Maybe my partner turns to me and I have to do it this way. Um, and on the right here, this is a Irish set dancing, which is also used uh, as a, a, uh, an intervention for people with Parkinson's in Ireland and in Italy, believe it or not. Uh, and again, some very complex patterns of couple dancing. People have to remember where they're supposed to be in space. They have to be able to get their partners there. Um, there's some really good research on, uh, on, on set dancing coming out now. So um, just some examples of the cognitive process in dance. This is going really back to the social idea that Oli had, right? We, when we're in dance class, we're very rarely doing a solo. Right? We are dancing together. We are looking at people. We are holding hands. We are dancing in lines and circles. These are ways that people have danced for thousands of years. This is not a new neuroscientific scientific discovery. This is the way that when you go back in the, the dance literature and you look at how uh, dances emerged in different cultures, whether it's Greek dancing, um, whether it's Balkan dancing, uh, whatever form it is, there it, it's about the community ritual, right? It's about uh, exchanging information together, or celebrating something together, or telling stories together. And so that is very much a part of this class. Um, sometimes people tell me, you know, this is the only time of the week where I have physical contact with somebody else. Otherwise, I'm just by myself. And it's so nice. It's so nice to be touched. It's so nice to have someone hold my hand. So. You know, this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to be together as human beings, for us to connect. Um, when I asked Oli Westheimer in our 15th anniversary, I said, what is the thing that stands out most for you about this program? She says, you know what? People come into the studio and they look at each other in the eye and they connect that way. And that's really, aside from all this other stuff, which I think is really important, that's a fundamental, fundamental thing. Finally, dancers express meaning through their movement. And this is one of the fundamental elements of intent. We see this in... In all of the art forms, when Yo-Yo Ma plays his cello, he's thinking about what he wants to say with that cello. He's not thinking about the notes. When Laurence Olivier would say his lines in Shakespeare, he's not thinking about the lines. He's thinking about what he wants to express, what meaning he wants the audience to come away with. What is, what is that character trying to say? The lines are a vehicle for that. So when dancers move, we're also thinking about what our meaning is. Why are we doing this move? What's the motivation? What's the intent? And we're going to do a little experiment with this together. So I'm going to have over here the jets and over here the sharks, OK? Jets, you are going to start pointing. And if you can, point over there. But if it's too awkward in your chair, you can point at me. Sharks, you're going to do the same thing eight counts after them. Then this group's going to do our little slap our Jerome Robbins rhythm, same thing over here, okay? Then we're going to expand, and you're going to explode at the other side. I want you to try to rumble with them if you can, all right? So send your energy towards each other, uh, and then uh, we'll go back and we'll do a, a little recap. At the very end, we're just going to expand and contract a couple times. I'll lead you through the whole thing. All right, Jets, you ready? All right. Starting your points, we go, hey. You, I'm gonna rumble. Yes. Pow. All right, sharks, your turn. Back at them. Poof. 
Nice. Slap. Sharks, you can do louder than that. Yes. Good. All right, everybody together. We expand. Very good. Play cool in between. One, expand, lift. <gasps> nice. Play it cool. Again, reaching up. Try to throw it over to the other gang. Pow! Good. We often will use our voices in this as well, but we're not warmed up, so we don't have to do that. Pow! Good. All together, pointing, both groups. You. Nice. Hey. Hey. Slapping. Good. Expanding. And softening. And expanding. And nice. Good. So, again, we're not in a studio. <laughs> we're not in class, but just you can start to see how that sense of interaction. And it's not always a, like a kumbaya, let's all stand together and be peaceful. There, we, we bring in all kinds of themes, but the idea is here we really have to watch other members of the group. We have to dance with them. We have to interact with them. We're, sending, we're, we're giving meaning to how we're dancing, right? We're taking on, often we're taking on a role, in this case from West Side Story. Um, so there's a lot of the movement that gets infused with this, this sense of meaning. So when we think about going back to our beginning here, what does exercise address? These very important elements, but I say, why not have it all, right? Adding all these other benefits that are very, very important to members of our group. And they tell us again and again how critical um, these elements are to them. So when we start to see everything together, we see a combination of elements that work together seamlessly to provide a full spectrum experience, right? We're not just talking about the physical here in dance. We're bringing in all of these other elements to work together and support each other. So I want to focus very briefly on a, a case study here that, uh, that looks at one particular aspect, which is walking. Um, and you may say, well, what does walking have to do with, with dancing? Well, I'm going to explain. We realize that a lot of people in our class spend most of their time away from our class, right? They're in class maybe an hour or two a week, but a lot of the time they're on their own. And when we asked them uh, about that experience, we said, what parts of class do you bring in to your day-to-day -day activity? They said, well, actually, we integrate some of the class, 66% of the people said we integrate some element of dancing in... Um, in our, in our daily lives, our activities of daily living. And 70% say they use music and rhythm more in their daily lives because of the class. So we were really interested in this. And we'd also heard from other groups how much people rely on this, th this musical sense to get them going. There have been measurable changes in balance and stability. It's very noticeable, actually, in quite a few people. For example, John, um, when he was walking across the floor right at the end of class to get his stick. And he was walking quite jauntily, quite normally, um, without st stuttering um, or stumbling at all, which he sometimes does. I can now walk and I can sing quietly inwardly. Nelly the elephant packed the trunk to stand in the circus, trumpety chump, and you walk to that and you can find it easier to walk. So if I'm in a difficult situation, that's what I do. See, Jane's walking off in rhythm, so she's still got the time and that tempo from the dancing in her head to actually help her move out. It's great to see that. I've taken charge of my own life now. I'm aware that I'm limited and restricted in what I do, but I want to improve the quality of my life the best way I can. So I love seeing the way John uses that very strong rhythm to help him motivate those walks. And we thought about this, and we thought about ways that we could help people do this on their own. Now, you might say, well, walking is really the purview of my physical therapist, right? They're, they, they're gonna help me with my walking. But dancers spend a lot of time thinking about walking. For us, walking is always expressive, it's always rhythmical, there's always something that happens that we're trying to ex uh, tell or express through our walking. Here's an example of walking in a piece of Mark Morris is called L'Allegro. You can see a very strong rhythmic 
walk with an accent up, down. So our goal was not necessarily to have uh, our participants do a L'Allegra walk down the street, but we thought about, you know, walking is really um, brought into so much of, of different dance techniques and different dance training. How can we think about walking that would be helpful for our participants? And just for, uh, I thought it would be interesting as well to talk about um, poetry and rhythm here for a moment, right? Um, often in dance, we're thinking about how we accent a walk. So for example, and what we just saw was maybe a, a, an iambic pentameter walk, that, that, uh, that time of year thou mayst in me. So there's a stronger and a weaker accent in the physical movement, just as there is here in the poetry. Um, the second, uh, the Longfellow here is more of a march, right? Tell me not in mournful, not right. The accent is very much on that first, uh, the stress is on that first um, syllable, right? Ta, 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 ta. So that's another way of thinking about rhythm, both verbally and physically. Here's uh, a triplet, but the uh, accent of the triplet here is on the last thing, on the sound of a voice that is still, right? So again, there's that, a lot of people say, well, I can't do a waltz. Well, that's, that's a waltz, right? That's a form of a waltz with an accent on the third. Or here's another kind of waltz, or the accent on the very first part. This is the forest primeval, the, right? So there's, there's a very strong connection between how we think about language rhythm and how we think about dance rhythm. And I think you saw that in John from London talking about his experience, Nelly the elephant, pat the trunk, right? And so just, just to, to back that up. So we saw an opportunity here to um, apply for some support from Google. And um, Google had a program called Giving Through Glass. And they basically asked nonprofit organizations to submit ideas for how to use this thing. Anybody seen this before? It's a Google Glass, right? Hasn't been very uh, popular as a consumer uh, Equipment as consumer equipment, it's actually been brought taken off the market, although it is still used uh, in very specific technical applications, at Boeing, for example, and other, other um, very specific ways. So, we developed an app that could be run on Google Glass that would help people actually take with them some of what we do in class, and a lot of it's related to walking. Uh, there are four modules on here, and you can cue it using your words. You can say, okay, Google, uh, okay, Glass, uh, warm me up, and it will take you right to this particular chapter, and you can watch a series of warm-up activities that are done seated. You could say, balance me, and it will help show you some balance activities. Um, these last two are really where we start to get into the, what I would think of as the more practical element, so helping people get out of a freeze. And what you're doing is you're actually able to see on this little cube here, see a dancer moving in front of you, and you're simply gonna try to entrain to that dancer while you're listening to music that's also being piped in through the, um, through the audio here. So it's essentially a, a, a private, um, interactive dance coach movement coach that you can carry with you. You can keep it on your head when you're not using it. And then when you need it, you can say, okay, Glass, walk with me. Image comes up, and you can start to see what I'm going to show you now. So essentially, this is what you would see on your, your prismatic screen here. So the idea here is that you would start to follow the guy in red, who's me, <laughs> and try to walk with that person as best you can. After about 15 seconds, the image starts to go away. The music continues to allow you to safely move through the streets of New York or Dallas or wherever you are without running into something. We thought if we keep the video on too long, we're going to run into trouble. So this is, um, this is really a prototype for um, uh, this product. We, we thought, let's see how it works. Let's get some data on it. Um, and we did a very small focus group in New York. About 64% said they would use. A lot of people said they really want the technology to be better, but the idea, the concept was great. So our 
idea now is to collect this data and try to figure out a way to present it so that we can work on a, a better platform for this particular idea that really allows people um, the, the privacy and flexibility of a, a personalized, uh, responsive coach. So just a little example of what else. Well, we also looked back in the research and we realized that you know, there's more, there's more that we can glean from walking. And what we realized was in all these studies, and we looked at some of the meta-analyses, there was a desire for a more robust understanding of what the mechanisms are. What, what, is, what are the underlying motor control mechanisms associated with the dance-related gain? So not just what's happening, but why does it seem to be happening? There also was a desire for more randomized controlled trials in dance, so comparing a dance intervention to other things. Um, and so we have been working the last three years with researchers at Washington University in St. Louis and at Columbia University working specifically on walking speed and whether the idea of learning a dance, a walking dance, kind of like L'Allegro but, but not, as, uh, not as complicated, learning a walking dance can actually change one's internal sense of walking speed. Because when we actually learn something, that is expressive and that has a, a connection to the music, we hypothesize that we may be able to embed that speed in an easier way than, say, if we learn it on a treadmill, right, without those, those motor cues. So this is something we're working on right now. This is just a little example of what this dance looks like right now. So you can see it's very um, staged out so that we really understand what the dose is, right? How much dancing is actually happening, is actually being delivered in this session so that we can compare it to a control. So I'm gonna wrap up here with a, a little question, which is where are we headed, right? We have all this great information. What is next? And people often ask me this. What is next for Dance for PD? What are the next things? Well, one is just a reminder and a consideration. I think it's really important that as we talk about things like walking or some of the physical parameters, as much as we are interested in studying that, we always come back to dance as um, a full-brained activity, right? It's not just about the logical, the linear, the systemic, the analytical, it's also about the expressive, the emotional, the creative, and the imaginative. So that has to be reflected in the class. It is certainly reflected in the feedback we get from participants. I love this top one because it really gets at it. You know, it's like, this is about being in the world of the arts. No matter how much we analyze it, there, there is a certain joy of being creative and expressive and feeling like you're at Carnegie Hall, right? And that you're not in a clinic. Um, I think the other element is that we're starting to see neurologists actually recognize the non-motor benefits of the class. Here's Helen Bronte Stewart again from Stanford, right? She says, yes, it's great physical activity, social interaction, and mental stimulation, but it also is uh, a way for people to experience a sense of restored self-image. It's a chance for people to, to experience joy. And I love hearing doctors talk about joy because it's not often expressed as an important value. For us in the arts, self-image, self-esteem, confidence, and joy are right up there with motor skill. So um, it's nice to hear the medical community start to recognize that even though we may not have research on this, or we, uh, we may not be able to prescribe things that help us with this, that we can understand that certain activities can foster joy, self-esteem, and confidence. Um, and we're starting to see research also that uses something called mixed methods models. So yes, there are physical therapy tests that were part of this study that was done um, with the group you saw from London at, um, at English National Ballet. Uh, but alongside those are quality of life studies, surveys, journaling, um, video analysis of movement that happens over the course of, of the class. So there's, there, there are more tools that we can use to really measure and understand the full impact of this, this program. I'm also uh, thrilled to see uh, programs that um, provide opportunities for our participants to perform. And this is from our, this is a project we did actually based on Mark Morris's L'Allegro um, dance that we, that we did with our participants in Brooklyn. They were able to learn material, rehearse material, and perform it to the general public. And I know Misty's group has also done performances here at the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, this really is, for me, the representation of empowerment, right? How do we allow people with Parkinson's or give them a platform to express themselves, to be creative, to be part of a performing group, and to take ownership of their movements and to be proud of their movements? This is something that's going on 
right now, actually, as part of the World Parkinson Congress lead up, the Crane Dance Project. This was not created in the central office in New York. This was actually thought up by a woman living with Parkinson's, Parkinson's in Los Angeles who participates in dance repeat classes there and came up with this idea of people around the world creating their own crane dances in honor of uh, Japan, where the World Parkinson Congress is being held, and submitting those and sharing them on video so that they could then be screened at the Congress. I know the group in Dallas, and I've seen your amazing dance, so thank you for that. You have submitted a dance, along with 120 other groups and people around the world. When Clara, the woman who originated this project, came to us, she said, I would, I would love to have 25. Do you think we can get 25? I said, I think we could probably get 25. Then it went up to 50, and then it went up to 100, now it's at 122 or something like that from 25 different countries. It's really a remarkable project, and the great thing about it is that it is driven by you. It's driven by people with Parkinson's. We are here really as a, as a, uh, just a distribu distributor, right? We have this project, we've gotten it out to everybody in the world, but it is the community that is creating it through your imagination, through your artistry, and through your commitment. So these, these projects really speak to what the future is gonna look like, which is much more, for me, much more community-driven work. So yes, we will still continue to offer classes and work with you in the studio, but we also want your voice to be much louder and present as co-creators in this, in this field. Uh, we will continue to see the program spread internationally as it has continued to do, and we will continue to glean really important information, both how the program can be delivered, what research comes from all of those different, um, those different locations. I hope we will continue to see other pioneers, like Dr. Bronte Stewart at Stanford, who see dance as part of the standard uh, approach for people with Parkinson's, right? That it's, it's brought into the healthcare model, not that it is any less... Uh, focused on art making and creativity, but that it is accepted as something that people with Parkinson's can do and that more physicians will actually recommend that their participants engage in, in dance. We're starting to see this a little bit in the UK, but this idea of social prescribing, uh, which is <laughs> actually very much like this. So uh, a uh, general practitioner, as they're called there, can write a prescription for a community-based arts activity, including dance, and that, is, uh, that can be covered by, uh, by the national insurance that they have in the UK. So it's a long road for this to happen here because of how our insurance system is structured, but I think we will start to see this in the next five to 10 years. It's called social prescribing. The other thing we're gonna start to see is that I think insurance companies, much in the same way as they have started to accept wellness as part of their portfolio and start to see that activities that relate to wellness actually help their bottom line by cutting costs. Um, we're gonna see more emphasis, I predict, on activities like dance for Parkinson's, on activities like um, dance for people surviving strokes and other, other forms of neurological challenge. We're actually seeing this already a little bit in the very progressive uh, company Kaiser Permanente, which has collaborated recently with San Francisco Ballet to offer dance for Parkinson's classes in San Francisco. So this is actually, this was driven by Kaiser. I think we're gonna see more of this in the future where insurance companies are finally saying, you know what, for, particularly for Parkinson's and other neuro neurological challenges, activities like dance have a measurable and beneficial out outcome. I think we're gonna see dance as a technology, right? Dance already is a technology if we take the original uh, root of technology here, which is a collection of techniques, skills, methods, and processes used in the accomplishment of objectives. So we might say, you know what, I really, for the next six months, I really want to work on my balance. And you might go and somebody might say, yeah, I think for this, we're really going to recommend a particular form of dance. Maybe for you right now, we're going to do Argentine Tango for four, four months, and then we're going to transition you into a tap class. So we can start to be a bit more strategic, perhaps, in how we use dance as a very robust technology. And I know we're all scared of technology because it often looks like this. But technology can also look like this. Right? So, for those of you who are, who are wondering what you can take away today, if you're not going to follow us into dance class this afternoon, here are a couple things to think about. One is, make training fun. 
right? This is what dancers have to do because the training is very rigorous. So if we don't have imagery and music to support us, it's gonna be really difficult to stay with it. We infuse it with imagination, we make it as creative as possible, and we introduce novelty. We're always learning something new, we're always thinking about our movement in a new way. Number two, we give meaning to every move. Everything we do has a meaning, has some kind of expression, right? It's not just a movement, it says something. Number three, music is the most wonderful guide. It doesn't have to be the music I like, it can be the music you like. And you put it on your iPod or your, your MP3 player and it is there for you during the day to help you move. Number four, plan everyday movement as a choreographer does. You have trouble with a corner in your apartment, think about a way that you can dance through that. I'm gonna take four steps to the side, I'm gonna turn around to the other direction and I'm gonna go. So you can really talk yourself through much as we did, we talked about with those, those dance plans, right? The, foot, the footwork that you saw for the, for the ballroom dance, that can be used for any kind of activity in your daily life that you have trouble with. Particularly things you do a lot, right? It's those automatic actions that are more difficult. Think about them as a choreographer was, would. How many, how many musical beats do I want to, to go over there? What image might I use to help me do that 90 degree turn, right? So really use those skills. Um, Sorry, I went ahead of myself here. Uh, we talked a lot about imagery, so if there's a particular task that's really difficult for you, think of an image that might support that. Don't think of the mechanics of it. Think about an image that can help supply that. Maybe look at a picture like I did today. I showed you water, right? Just to help with that idea. Think about movement moving through a particular element um, or using a particular image to support your movement. And finally, using social connections to move and to stay motivated. I think a lot of people in our class really like the idea of dancing, like the experience of dancing, but what brings them back every week is the fact that they get to see their friends, right? They get to see people they dance with every week. They love talking to them, they hang out with them. Oh, and they get to dance as well. So it's, it's that social connection, that desire to be seen as a, as a motivator. I'm gonna finish because a lot of people say, well, how can I do that by myself? I really have to be in a group class. So I thought I would just finish here with um, Cindy Gilbertson, who is a participant in our Brooklyn class. And this is a, an excerpt from a wonderful documentary called Capturing Grace, directed by Dave Iverson. Um, and this is, this is Cindy's story at home. It's a very short clip, but it really gives you a sense of how she thinks of herself as a dancer, how that changes her value, her sense of value in herself, and how she uses dance as a way of moving around. I've learned to value myself more, which is quite a gift. When I'm slumping, I say to myself, I'm a dancer. I have to sit up straight. I am a dancer. And it, it gives me motivation to take better care of myself. When the medicine is working, I can almost do everything. It's just that the amounts of time there get shorter and shorter when it functions. Parkinson's forces you to reveal your vulnerabilities. You know, otherwise people mostly try to put on their best face, their best appearance. You know, I'm going out in public, I have to put on this and that, and I have to put my overcoat button it uptight. Well, you can't, if you're going with Parkinson's and you can't button it, you're, you're revealed, you know, there's no way about it. What happens to me when my feet feel like glue and they're stuck on the floor? I sometimes cannot walk, but I can dance. If I, I can, um, I don't know, I can give you an example. Should I start? Yeah. Well, for example, Right now, I'm, I'm off. You can see my hand is shaking. I have the tremor. And if I try to walk, I have a great deal of difficulty. Um, I could walk a little bit. But if I pretend I'm dancing, I could go.
and I don't have any problems. The music leads. In other words, it's not my brain telling me to take a step or to do this or do that. The music is leading me. So I'm like following this wonderful leader who's so mysterious and has such a lovely sound and it's gonna take me to some other place. What is that other place? Um, well, excuse me. It's a place where um, you're weightless, you know, you just, your body is just, um, it just flies. It doesn't tug at you, <laughs> tug you and pull you and push you and, um, you know, have you in these knots where you can't move and you can't think and you're struggling and fighting. It just, you know, you, you, you go above that. Big thank you to Cindy and Dave for allowing us to use that clip. Thank you to my colleagues and re co uh, researchers. Thank you to my favorite dancers, my family, for letting me be here this weekend. Um, I just, I know we're a little over, but I did want to leave a little time for questions, if you had any questions. But it's just been such a great pleasure sharing with you and dancing with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. So Leslie and I have microphones. If you would wait until the microphone gets to you um, so the people who are watching online can hear the question. I wanted to start with a question from somebody who's watching on Facebook, Catherine, uh, who wanted to know a little bit more about the DVDs. Um, are they still available and where can you buy one? Sure. Thanks for the question, Catherine. Our DVDs are available. They're actually available both as DVDs and as video on demand for people who don't have DVD players anymore, which seems to be a growing proportion of folks. So uh, the DVDs are available at our website, which is www.dance4pd.org. We ship all over the world. Um, and if you have any questions, you can let us know. But the, the website is right there, danceforpd.org. And yes, they're available. We, we ship them all the time. So. All right, we have a question over here. Do they know what exactly is the neurology behind that phenomenon? Um, no. When, when I actually had a conversation in a public forum with Dr. Bronte Stewart about this, we did a screening of Capturing Grace at Stanford, and that exact question came up, and neurologists don't, don't know for sure. Uh, and what, seems, what, what may be a possibility is that the act of intentional thinking, conscious thinking, about movement um, detours the automaticity that we were used to rely on and that is controlled by the basal ganglia and actually uses different parts of the brain to initiate movement. So instead of relying on the automatic programs that may be less reliable, we're actually intentionally thinking about each move. It doesn't look like, and Cindy says, well, you know, it's not my brain doing it, it's the music, but she's going through uh, a very complex process of listening to the music and making split-second decisions that engage the, the thinking, cognitive part of her brain rather than the automatic part of her brain. And that, that may be one explanation, but we just don't know for sure. We do know that music has the ability to synthesize and bring together different areas of the brain to work together. It is, it is a synthesizing uh, input. So when you look at the brain listening to music, you see versus not, or listening to conversation, there are many more uh, areas of the brain that light up and that seem to be connected together. So that may be another a way of modeling what's happening. But we, we think of it most clearly as a detour around the automatic and into the conscious intentional. Question yeah. right here. <clears throat> I found in Parkinson's physical therapy and um, speech, varying degrees of instructors. Do you have a credit, do instructors become accredited for dance? It's a great question. So in our training program, 
uh, we have a certain set of requirements for instructors. They have to have had three to five years of dance teaching experience. Um, we also have a certification program for those instructors who have gone through all of our training and have completed 50 hours of teaching in the field. They then have an extra course, which is, uh, usually takes about four to six months of uh, reviewing their teaching, right? Because we, we can't travel to all their sites, so they send us their class on video. We critique that. They take several online exams. Um, there's some written work, and so it ends up being a, f a pretty full process. So for us, we have two levels. We have um, a large pool of instructors who are out there in community right now teaching this work. Um, and then we have a, a, a smaller cohort of people who have actually gone through certification and are able to use the dance repeating name and brand. So the certification program is only two years old. So you'll start to see more people from that first pool coming into that, uh, that more advanced pool. And so yes, there is, there is a certification program for sure. But it's not necessarily a degree. Should be a degree, but it's not yet. Yeah. Hi. So what classes are available? The question was, what classes are available in Dallas? So there are wonderful classes here that Misty Owens teaches twice a week at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital, um, the Finley Ewing CVC, um, and those are offered twice a week here. Uh, I don't know the days. Anybody know the days? Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 o'clock at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital. Um, there's actually a class there that I'm teaching this afternoon. So that class is at 2.30, and I have directions for that class. So if you are coming for the first time and would like to check it out, come, come get one of these after, um, and I, I would love to see you there. It's going to be a, a fun afternoon. Dallas or Say again. Dallas or Plano Hospital? Um, it's the Dallas, Dallas. Hospital. <laughs> it's, it's Greenville. It's the Greenville Ave building in Dallas, Phoenix Drive. It's, it's, a, it's a Walnut Hill in Greenville area. Finley Ewing Cardiovascular and Fitness Center, Greenville Ave building, Phoenix Drive, 5721 Phoenix Drive in Dallas. And it's a fabulous class. So Misty... Uh, worked with us in New York for 10 years and then moved to Dallas and it was a great loss to us and a great gain for you. And we miss her very much, but she's amazing. How do you get the word out to dance instructors so that they find out about it and become interested? Yeah, that's a great question. We use a variety of means. We uh, work with organizations like the NDEO, which is the National Dance Education Organization, which is sort of the national... Uh, support organization for dancers, uh, dance teachers of all stripes, all ages, um, and there's an annual conference, so we've done presentations at that conference. We also uh, get our information out to an organization called Career Transitions for Dancers, which is now part of the Actors Fund, um, and they help trans transitioning dancers out of performing careers into other meaningful employment, and so that's another, another great source for us. We also work with a number of dance companies um, and dance presenters, so theaters who actually present dance all over the country who present our company, and we work with them to help get the word out about this particular program. Often people will come to a demonstration class and they say, wow, I really love this. I'm a teacher. I, I want to do this. How do I get trained? And then we work with them there. But we get, we get a number of, I would say, you know, probably four to five inquiries every week from uh, dance instructors all over the world who are who are interested in this and who, who are really passionate about it. So it's great. We're very lucky. We do four trainings a year in New York and usually four to six outside of New York. That includes the U.S. and internationally. Um, so last year we offered trainings, obviously, four in New York. Uh, we also did workshops in Rio de Janeiro, Beijing, China, Seoul, South Korea, um, this year we've done trainings in Charlotte, and um, we should do one out on the West Coast, either Washington State or California. So it's, it's, it's a lot. We, we do try to uh, go to people where they are, but we, like PVC, we're, we're a nonprofit, so we, it's really difficult for us just to say, oh, sure, we'll go there, and you know, without any financial support. So we really have to make sure there's a critical mass of teachers or an organization that's willing to underwrite the training to, to make it happen. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Any others? 
All right, then we're finished. So thank you so much, David, for coming to talk. My, my pleasure. Thank you. And come get your directions if you want. Yeah? Thank you. We have a gift for you before you go. <laughs> my goodness. This is a photograph of a tulip in honor of Parkinson's. It was taken by one of our loud crowd members, Keva, who's a wow. photographer. We hope you'll take this back to uh, Dance for Petey. I would be honored. <laughs> I, I know exactly where it can go in our, in our <laughs> studio. So thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Samantha, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful gift. Thank you. Wow. All Thanks. right. Right. Uh, so this is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Next month is uh, Better Hearing and Speech Month for May. We will not have a lecture next month, but we do have our Talk Walk event, which will be held here in Dallas at North Park Center. It's a free family educational event and fun event. There will be lots of prizes, door prizes. So if you're here in the area, we'd love for you to come and join us on May the 4th at North Park Center. You can find more information online. Um, it is Talk Walk. It's about getting out in the community, talking. Even if you're not here in Dallas, we'd love for you to go walk and talk with your friends. Uh, so please take part in whatever way you can. Uh, so we also wanted to remind you that any donations made uh, this weekend, either in person here today or online, will go towards our $50 million endowment fund that we're trying to build. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can help us, like Samantha said, chip away at that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We we'll hope we hope we see you at Talk Walk next month. Thank you so much. <laughs>